Welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast, where we explore the exciting science behind heart rate variability. The material discussed in this podcast should not be taken as medical advice. Please check with your medical provider to make sure any suggestions or strategies are right for you. Visit us at the OptimalHRV.com website to learn more about the Optimal HRV app, download a free copy of Matt's book, Heart Rate Variability, and also get show notes and additional resources around heart rate variability and its application. Welcome, friends, to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. I'm Matt Bennett, back with you today. Um, I'm excited. I, I feel like I have a legend in the field of heart rate variability and a future legend in the field of heart rate variability. If you haven't heard uh, Anna's uh, podcast, I think it was two or three ago. Um, I was I was already impressed with Anna's work, and then the podcast. I was like. I can't let her go. So uh, we offered her a spot on our nonprofit board at Optimal Innovation Group. She was gracious enough to uh, accept and uh, quickly uh, reached out for her to co-host this episode with me. So uh, I'm excited to bring her voice to the table. And Anna, I know you have a connection uh, with our guests today. So I'm going to hand it over to you to do uh, sort of a brief introduction. Uh, like I said, we got a, a real legend in the field today. So uh, I'll hand it over to you. And I'm just so looking forward to this conversation. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me again. And thank you, Dr. Gerberts, for being here. We're really excited to have you. Um, so I'm just going to do a little introduction that I just put together. I'm sure it won't get everything that you've done in your work, but bear with us here. So, um, all right. So today, our honorable guest for the Heart Rate Variability Podcast is Dr. Richard Gerberts. He is a licensed clinical psychologist and distinguished professor of psychology for the California School of Professional Psychology at Alliant International University in San Diego. He has been involved in research and clinical work in applied psychophysiology and biofeedback for the last 30 years and served as the president of the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback from 2006 to 2007. His primary research interests are in understanding the physiology and psychological mediators involved in disorders such as chronic muscle pain, fibromyalgia, and gastrointestinal pain. In this vein, he has studied applications of heart rate variability, biofeedback for anxiety, pain, gastrointestinal, cardiac rehabilitation, and other disorders. He is the author of many journal articles and chapters on these topics. He also maintains a part-time clinical practice treating patients with anxiety and stress-related disorders. I had the honor and privilege to be taught and mentored in biofeedback during my second year of graduate school. When I share with other biofeedback providers and researchers that he has taught my course and mentored me in my certification, they always say, wow, you're really blessed. He is one of the best. He has remained a mentor to me in clinical work and in entering the research arena. Welcome, Dr. Gavers. It is an honor to have you as our guest today. Awesome. That is the most formal introduction we have ever given any guest. So, and a great, great job. So I, I would love to start out uh, to, to learn a little bit. I, I mean, your, your bio is impressive. I was looking at all the publications um, definitely on the Mount Rushmore of heart rate variability for sure. And so what, what I'd love to hear, like, how did you, you know, get introduced to heart rate variability? And I, I just kind of love to learn a little bit about your journey with HRV. Yeah, the, uh, we're just actually publishing a nice little uh, special issue of the uh, applied psychophysiology and biofeedback with all of our kind of stories of how we got here so awesome should be coming out the next issue just in case anyone's interested um also just so you can you can tell how lucky i am to have people like anna as students so it definitely keeps me going so we get we get a few students a year who are really interested in this stuff and it's what makes my job great they come in they're excited it's te it's technical stuff they really want to learn it and they learn it and go out and spread the word. So it's really, really great <clears throat> to uh, have people like Anna in our program that do this. She was one of the most enthusiastic students in the class I've ever had. She asked so many questions, <laughs> which actually I loved. That was because I've had a couple of years of classes where no one asked any questions. 
And that's a bad sign. <laughs> well, it's good too, because now I ask her questions and she's teaching me. So uh, there's some vicarious learning going on for sure. Well, so my journey started actually an undergraduate. Uh, I was very lucky to be a student of Peter Lang. Uh, for those who don't know Peter Lang, he's really one of the founders of the field of psychophysiology and has a couple of really main uh, uh, publications hundreds of publications, but some that really changed the way people look at it. And this was in the 19, uh, early 1960s in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, where there wasn't very good technology for the measurement of stuff. Um, but on Peter's class that I, it was a graduate class that he let a few undergraduates in. I was, I wormed my way in by uh, taking him sailing actually, because I'm an avid sailor. And he wanted to learn how to sail, so I bribed him by taking him sailing. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so his course was called Blood, Sweat, and Tears, which was the introduction to psychophysiology. <laughs> and he, he, to this day, is an unbelievable, he's still going at, a, at an older age, and he's an unbelievable intellect of, and uh, mentor. Um, but... From that, I kind of, I, I really was always very interested in mind-body issues. I really didn't even want to go into clinical psych because I didn't think it was scientific enough. And, <clears throat> but that kind of piqued my interest. Uh, I spent my senior year um, doing a senior thesis, measuring just heart rate, not heart rate variability. At that time, we needed a half-time engineer and a half a room of equipment just to do ambulatory heart rate. Uh, and the study was actually on desensitization for snake phobia. And <clears throat> it was a control group who, who didn't really get desensitization. They just had to come back for post-test. I think Anna's heard the story. Uh, I spent my senior year in girls' dormitories begging the control group to come back to the lab for the post-test. <laughs> we, we had a live little boa constrictor in the lab. And <laughs> Uh, the people in the control group didn't lower their fears at all, so they didn't want to go in the building. <laughs> so in those days, uh, you guys are too young, but those days, dormitories were men and women, and the women's dorms had like glass shields so the men couldn't get in. And so <laughs> I, I'd have to be, I'd have to come in. The, the main, the biggest one, if anyone's older watching this, is called Liz Waters Hall. It's a very <laughs> large girls' dormitory women's dormitory and and had a receptionist you know that who was a guard they couldn't get in there so this these receptionists knew me because i'd come in and say please call somebody tell them to come down and i need them to to finish my thesis i need them to come. <laughs> anyway those are the beginnings of the issues of technology and uh and benefits of uh, that was just heart rate not heart rate rehabilitating uh so then after that i uh, when i went to grad school i I got put into a lab uh, in perception, <clears throat> although I never lost my interest in this. I had to do what I had to do to get through. Uh, but as soon as I was done, I, I went back and started working on uh, my first job was in a small college in Minnesota, not too far from the Mayo Clinic. <clears throat> so I started doing psychophysiology technology and improved by then. So I was able to get better measures. We're actually doing measures of uh, pulse transit time, which is Still not a very common measure, but it's actually a fairly interesting one where you actually measure the time it takes the R wave to get from the heart to the finger. Hmm. And what determines the speed of that is actually the camber of the major arteries. So if the arteries are constricted, it goes faster. If the arteries are dilated, it goes slower. So it originally was thought maybe to be a, a, a biomarker for blood pressure. It turned out not to be great for that. But it is an interesting measure of arterial regulation in the body. And we still actually are using it a little bit. Hmm. Anyway, so I got, I, I ended up, there was some equipment available. I would, they, the college I was at let me teach a course in psychophysiology and applied psychophysiology. Um, and one of the earlier students I had had gone on to medical school and was the doctor in town. And I had sort of been dabbling in biofeedback by then. Um, I was lucky enough to be near Mayo Clinic and uh, Mark Schwartz, who's the author of our, our major textbook about feedback was there. 
and I managed to get him as a speaker. And then he and I started working together on a bunch of projects. And we started the Biofeedback Society of Minnesota. In those days, BSA, Biofeedback Society of America, was fairly young. Uh, so I got involved. And um, as you can see, Anna, as soon as you get involved in these things, people hit you up and make you do things on boards. <laughs> <laughs> so I got put I got put ahead of BCIA for two terms, actually, which was torture, actually. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, a, a warning is don't be in charge of an of a organization that gives certifications to people or, or denies them. <laughs> <laughs> Could, that's some good you, wisdom right there <laughs> i won't tell you all the stories of what i went through but i was i was stalked on several events several occasions by people <laughs> who had failed the bcaa test anyway uh so i i wasn't a, i wasn't a licensed clinician i was a, just a collagen professor uh, but i was interested in about feedback and so i went back and got licensed so that i could do because the the dr christensen my ex-student who was an MD said, I've got people here who need to need biofeedback. Now at this time, all we were doing was EMG, temperature, heart rate, not heart rate variability, respiration, uh, and in that time, a little bit of the um, uh, pulse transit time. But so I started working with some clients for the first time in my career, really. Uh, I did it in the medical clinic, and the first person I treated was a person who got very severe migraines during her menstrual cycle. I uh, sorry, during pregnancies, and she was a, a nice Catholic woman and was going on her eighth pregnancy, and she was fit to be tied because she was going to get a migraine through the whole pregnancy. So, so Dr. Christensen said, you got to do something with her, do some biofeedback. So I had no idea what to do really, but I did breathing and hand warming and EMG relaxation. The first session she fainted because she had low blood pressure and she fainted when she did the relaxation. I thought I had killed my first person, <laughs> but, but she got better and she got through her pregnancy with like four migraines the whole time. Wow. And I said, wow, this is fun. <laughs> this stuff is really cool. So um, after we came to San Diego, by then I had bought uh, quite a lot of equipment and uh, I started a, a practice and started in CSPP using biofeedback. Again, not using heart rate variability at the time, but using the other modalities. But I was also friends with Steve Porges and I knew of the work of Julian Thayer, who is now a good friend of mine. And Steve's, especially Steve's 95 article, if you haven't read it, everybody should read that article, uh, where it just changed everything I knew about the autonomic nervous system. To think about vagal withdrawal as the primary issue for most people as rather than sympathetic arousal. Uh, and, but of course, we had no way of measuring that. Mm -hmm. So I actually tried a few crazy things. Like I tried using those little, um, probably nowadays they don't do it anymore. They used to use cotton cylinders in your mouth of the dentist to take the saliva. Mm, yeah. Instead of having the suction. Uh, and salivation is a parasympathetic response, right? So we, we actually had people weighing those little cotton balls. And that, as you might guess, didn't work very well. Uh, but from Porges, I knew that um, if I could get equipment that would measure beat by beat heart rate, that there was a way of measuring the, uh, the parasympathetic the vagal, vagal activity in the body. And I, th I thought we really were missing the boat in biofeedback by only looking at sympathetic or voluntary responses. Um, so I managed to get in touch with uh, the, one of the earliest manufacturers was Jan Hoover of j, &J Electronics. And I also knew <clears throat> a little, I knew at that time, I knew the thought technology folks a bit. Uh, but Jan is a brilliant engineer to this day. And I met him at, at one of the national meetings and told him what we needed. And being an engineer, he just loved the idea of the challenge of it. And like within about seven, eight months, I flew up to, to Poulsbo, to Bainbridge Island in Poulsbo in Washington, where he was. And he had produced the first biofeedback equipment that I knew of. 
that was uh, commercially available that would measure beat by beat activity. Um, it wasn't perfect uh, and it wasn't exportable until we kind of figured out we needed to export those IBIs, but um, it seemed like a whole new world opened up. And so I had a student then who wanted to do something on blood pressure and kind of labile hypertensives. And I said, well, that's probably a parasympathetic phenomena. So we kind of did a study and her name was Herbs, uh, Diane Herbs. And uh, so we did a study where we did the first, my first HRV biofeedback study. I also knew Paul Lehrer was doing some stuff at Rutgers with asthma for almost the same reasons, because asthmatic response is a parasympathetic response. And his story is a great, you should have him on. His story is a great story, <clears throat> uh, how he kind of discovered it in Russia and stuff. Uh, but he and I were friends and we said, well, you do your thing, I'll do my thing, let's compare notes. And uh, both of us had some pretty good results from the first study. Um, we did finger temperature training compared to HRV. Uh, it was very crude HRV at the time, but <clears throat> it was HRV biofeedback. And uh, that was the beginning. The, and we, we, begin, we started to see the possibilities of this at that point. So then uh, we, we got the manufacturers started producing, they consulted us luckily, and we told them what we wanted. And so Thought Tech, and uh, then came in Nexus and J&J, &J, and uh, uh, by a couple of other ones, some Russians had, had left Russia and were doing some other stuff up in Washington too. They all started producing um, equipment that would do HRV biofeedback uh, at prices that were not completely crazy. Uh, it's a lot, still a lot more than we can get it for now, but still reasonable. Um, as, as opposed to the way you could do it up till then was just with big giant lab equipment. Um, so, um, so then uh, we started seeing the light and then uh, the, next, the next chapter is where Paul and I, Paul met Evgeny Vashilo, um, who is the Russian cosmonauts physiologist um, and so, you know, that great story about that one where he was watching one of the cosmonauts during meditation and he saw these big peaks and valleys mm. and he thought he was dying of space sickness. And he asked the Yuri, what are you doing? He said, shut up, I'm meditating, right? So, <laughs> and uh, so Evgeny, who was a brilliant, who was, he just passed away a few years ago, and sadly, uh, was, was a brilliant, he was a systems engineer and a physiologist. And he had the exact right credentials to figure this out. And so he, he basically figured it out. Paul managed to just meet him by chance really in Russia and uh, got him to come to a Society for Psychophysiological Research meeting in, uh, in um, Massachusetts. And again, he never spoke English very well, but his son did. So we managed to get his son and his wife and we spent like a 12 hour day locked in a hotel room in Cape Cod trying to pick his brain. And ultimately we mostly did pick his brain to figure out all the stuff that we know about heart rate variability biofeedback. There, there was a lot of knowledge about heart rate variability measurement but it was mostly all in cardiology. Hmm. And so, you know, I, I knew some of the cardiologists and some of the work they were doing and all that was interesting to me, but that wasn't biofeedback. So this was a whole different thing. And uh, so that's, that was the beginning of the story. And then from then on, we both have been trying to crank out small studies. We both tried to get bigger funding, but um, we ran into the problem is that NIH thought we were complementary medicine. Complementary medicine said we were mainstream medicine. And so uh, Paul got a number of grants rejected. I had a few, I was on a few that got rejected. Um, but just recently, uh, much to our great delight, uh, one of our colleagues at University of Southern California, Mara Mather, uh, a few years ago obtained a multi-million dollar grant to do to, to study heart rate variability biofeedback um, and with a really clever control group. And that the results of that study, which we presented elsewhere are fantastic, so. Great, awesome. 
So, you know, I, I would just kind of wonder as you sort of see, you know, and I, and I love it because I'm sort of uh, in, in age between you and Anna uh, uh, with this is, you know, as, as somebody who was in graduate school for counseling psychology in the mid 90s, I, I just th there was nothing about biofeedback. Uh, I mean, we had, there, there was no mention of it even. And, you know, and, and technology was different if you weren't alive in the, you know, uh, mid 90s. We were just getting something called email at that point. And. I, I sort of wonder, as, as you have seen, now we've got watches on that supposedly measure heart rate variability. Bluetooth is, you know, even some cell phones you can maybe get an accurate reading off of now. Um, just sort of like, how have you seen, you know, this kind of start to influence mental health? Uh, you know, where, like I said, counseling psych classes never heard of bio, biofeedback was never mentioned, and now it's on a lot of people's wrists. And I just kind of want, I'd love to get your perspective of sort of, you know, the, the last few years as technologies seem to have just exploded from something that might have taken off half an office now can kind of fit on your wrist. Yeah, yeah. Well, my whole career has been dependent on changes in technology, as yeah. you've heard, so... Uh, but, you know, uh, academia has not been influenced by this very much. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few undergraduate programs. Um, Fred Schaefer, you guys know, at Truman State has, has this wonderful program for years. But even then, very few of those kids, they're mostly pre-meds, so very few of those kids have gone into the field. Um, the Saybrook has a program. We have a program. Uh, we, 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 right now it's kind of dormant, but Anna just met a new faculty at Nova Southwestern, who I think will be starting up a program. There was one from Doyle Montgomery there, and that's pretty much it that I know of. No, nobody else is doing it. Now, there's quite a few programs in the country doing psychophysiology, mm -hmm. um, but usually with sophisticated equipment and a lot of that has migrated to uh, EEG or evoke potential research. But there still is the, the field of psychophysiology. If you look at the journal psychophysiology, there are a fairly good number of HRV papers, usually measurement papers, not, not biofeedback. Uh, but so it's a little frustrating that um, what we obviously see as such a powerful tool in the world is mostly been in uh, on the periphery, um, uh, big in terms of uh, athletic performance, uh, big in terms of you know uh, an internet presence all over the place, uh, but very little in the way of academic training and um, especially in clinical psychology, which seems crazy to me. But like even in our institution, uh, you can talk to this. How many of your peers? said, oh, that sounds great, but that's not for me. I mean, right. it's a bit technical. It's a bit, it's a new thing. It's something you have to kind of have some interest in. Yeah, I remember uh, my, in the podcast I did, I talked about how it seemed like a lot of people it was just like out of their comfort zone. Um, and so then it was kind of like, okay, I'm not going to step into that. Um, but I felt like that for me, like I was always taught when you go to school or graduate school, if you don't step out of your comfort zone, you're not going to grow. So that was just kind of like the, I guess the compass I was following. But I mean, I, I know even people who like took the course and they were just like kind of overwhelmed by the, the technicalities behind it. Um, but, you know, kind of like what you were saying, I, I originally wanted to go into medical school and do more like, uh, more like hard science kind of work. And I was worried, you know, if I do clinical psych, will it be you know, scientific enough <laughs> and biofeedback was a cool way to kind of meet that middle spot so that we can work in medical settings and work with medical providers. So I feel like if we don't have this bridge, we're going to have a big gap. Yeah, I think that's a very good insight. And I think that's right. Another area that this has been true in has been physical therapy mm -hmm. in rehab and rehab. In the early days, we had Steve Wolf was very active in our field. Uh, and he's a giant in, uh, in rehab, in, in uh, neuroscience of rehab. And so he, in those days, we had a lot of physical therapists in the, in the society using biofeedback for neuromuscular reeducation. And that's 
pretty much gone out of our field completely. Again, it's just out of their comfort zone. It's mm -hmm. a it's a whole series of things that they're not trained in to start with, and uh, despite our best efforts, that hasn't really happened uh, as as well. So I think you're exactly right. Um, the the student who's defending at three o'clock was uh, was a health student who has not done a thing with psychophys or apply or biofeedback since since he took the course. He moved into other areas. Good student. And so yeah, we've got a ways to go. Uh, but I do feel like you're right. Momentum is building. Uh, the most people have heard of it at least, and when they kind of learn about it, they seems pretty cool. The new technologies are very cool. Uh, prices are coming down for uh, a lot of the equipment now. So I think we are on the verge of uh, more of this. I certainly am. I get contacted a lot by people all over the world who want training. Um, and so I think, then some of them want to incorporate it into postdocs. It may happen more in postdocs than it will in actual graduate programs. It's a little hard to squeeze them into APA programs. Yeah. Uh, but or like in counseling programs like you were in, those curricula are pretty full. Mm -hmm. And then we have counseling programs that get none of it at all in our university. They, they never heard of it, right? So Yeah, it just seems like technology is so profuse in everything we do. And, you know, with heart rate variability, why I just couldn't let it go was like, you know, with my background, working with uh, folks with trauma histories, I never could measure whether my interventions were really trying, helping to heal the nervous system that I was reading all these books about. And it's just like, the, the one thing that I thought I wanted to know what I was doing in like to purchase a functional MRI probably wasn't practical even, <laughs> but definitely not in my budget. I actually Googled it once at a, a child residential facility I was working at and realized I should uh, stop Googling functional MRIs because, you know, out of my price range with my budget. But, yeah. you know, the, the interesting thing, and I, I'd love to get your kind of thoughts on this as well is. You know, there, there's been, and, and, and I've heard Stephen Porges talk a couple of times about how when the, the trauma world, which has just, you know, exploded as, as well, it, I've been doing it for 20 years. And, you know, when Oprah writes a book on your, your, your passion and what you've dedicated, things change. Um, <laughs> so now like the adverse childhood experience study and all this is too. So, so it's, it's interesting because like Porges kind of got, in, in some ways, and then this is a, a layman's uh, example of uh, trying to put together some of his talks of, you know, the trauma world found polyvagal theory and, and really kind of breathed additional energy because his work was brilliant, but before the trauma folks, you know, and, and I, I'd love to see kind of as, as we've had this explosion of interest, understanding science, pseudoscience around the nervous system you know, you, you must have been on this ride too in some ways of seeing just this, uh, the world coming sort of into your realm with, you know, the, this interest in the brain. And now, thanks to Porges and others like yourself, uh, the autonomic uh, nervous system as well. Yeah, def definitely more interest. And, and, and again, there is, there's strong academic interest in measurement of HRV. So you got a lot of very sophisticated labs doing, and they, they almost all do it right. But there's also a, a, a downside to it. There's a, uh, it's also been picked up by some of the flakier elements, mm -hmm. especially in the trauma world. Yeah. Um, so Bessel van der Kolk has been the other person along with Steve yeah. that really, you know, the body doesn't forget kind of thing, which mm -hmm. I think very powerful insights into trauma. But he has also gone off on crazy things too. And so among the, like we have uh, three uh, internationally known trauma researchers, uh, I've had to really drag them into this because they, they see it as a little bit on the outside of what good science is for this. Um, they, I think we've got them, we've got them uh, interested now, but it's taken a while. So there, it's gonna be, a, it's gonna take a little while. Right now, they, trauma folks seem to be enamored with neurofeedback. Uh, and I don't quite understand why. I know Bessel, Bessel and I worked together with HRV for a while um, and he had, seemed happy with it. And then he told me he, he could only do one thing at a time and he got interested in, in neurofeedback and that's what he pushed. 
So now there are um, a lot of these folks and some of his disciples too, who are, because uh, now we know a little, we know a lot more about the neuroscience of trauma. Mm -hmm. Since we know that, the question is, can you make some changes in, in the brain with neurofeedback? I think it remains to be seen. Uh, there, it's an, it could be an exciting area, but it's also, you know, 40 sessions and very difficult to do the studies on it. And so we're, we're in that place. But at least I think there is a growing awareness of in, including the body in, into the picture when it comes to trauma. Um, and we would love to just for put it out there. We've had two studies where we've tried to add HRV biofeedback to uh, prolonged exposure or CPT awesome. as, as a control. That's the study that needs to be done with a good size sample. Yeah. And both of them failed because they were military and the, the pr principal investigators got deployed. Oh. Let me put it out there. I'm absolutely willing to volunteer as much of my time as necessary to anybody who's willing to do that study. Yeah. Because um, I think it's a very easy study to do if you're doing empirically based therapies for trauma. All we want you to do is add a little bit of the HRV into it and let's look at the outcomes. We have pretty good evidence from one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Dahlenberg, that it's about a 25% boost over the other empirically based therapies, but not with controlled studies, only with long series of case studies. And so, boy, that that sort of improvement though, we've we've got, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've got to get this because I I think it is such a you know big. I mean, a 25% increase. Uh, that's that's life saving for some people, uh, right. Right. especially with the complex trauma. Right. Yeah. So you're. You're connected to that world, so I'm putting the plea out here. All right, let's somebody, do it. <laughs> some, we could maybe do it as a collective study uh, with everybody would run a few cases nationally. You're, you're going to get a pretty big following. Yeah. Um, and I'd be very happy to train or collaborate, and I'm sure Anna would too, with anybody who uh, wants to do that. And we, we could maybe put together a decent sized study, seeing how much we can add to our outcomes um, and, it, you know, to, I, I'm all for CPT and uh, prolonged exposure, but as you probably know, half the people won't do it. Right. I mean, exactly. it's so frightening to them to come in and be exposed to what their, what their trauma is. So I think if we looked at dropout rates and we looked at uh, trauma symptom reductions, I think we, we know from our anecdotal evidence that it's going to help. Uh, but uh, I think we could really influence the trauma world with a good controlled study. Yeah, well, we'll count. I, I imagine, and I'm talking for you too. I see your head shaking. Count us in. Uh, uh, let, let's have that conversation and continue that because you, you know, I, we, I think really the the trauma world. I mean, psychology is just as I say, psychology kind of has gotten cooler since I was trained. You know, I was talk therapy, Rogerian, uh, a little bit CBT was starting to take hold and behavioralism, in my opinion, thank goodness, was sort of fading a little bit into the background. And it's just like this, the, the technology piece, which I've just been, I was desperate for anything that worked mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, you know, working, especially before we got like EMDR and some of these other best practices, there, there wasn't, there, there seemed to be a, not much there. And it kind of leads to my uh, other question I wanted to ask you is one of my, I think, the, 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 the frustrations that, that I had, and as a ignorant, I will admit my ignorance on this, of somebody who just was trying to find stuff that was work, working with youth in the child welfare system, then moving into homelessness, is that there wasn't much biofeedback available for those folks. Uh, it sort of seemed to exist in universities, you know, it, it never sort of got, I've, I've not really seen biofeedback, like in a homeless shelter, for example, people whose stress responses are off the chart because of life situations. And I, I wonder if I'm just kind of missing that boat or uh, has there been work with, you know, trying to figure out how to get biofeedback? One of the reasons I started Optimal HRV is because I, I wanted to, to get 
some information of what, what's what's a long term shelter, what's a housing first program, what's you know what what do what do, are these interventions impacting the autonomic nervous system, and and I wonder if there's there been any work kind of trying to get into those areas uh, of like there are probably more social work historically. Yeah, no, there really there have been a couple of of attempts. Uh, we we have a placement um, for our students here in San Diego uh, at uh, Father Joe, that's a homeless training shelter. And so one of our former, long ago former students was the, was the training director there. He was interested, uh, but those places are just swamped. They have no money. Yeah. Um, so it's gonna be, it's gonna be an uphill battle. Maybe with some of the new little inexpensive PPG devices and like websites like yours, or you know the the um, programs like yours, we might be able to worm it in. Every time it's been tried anecdotally, it's been the most popular intervention. There yeah. was a, there was a couple of those, that, and people love it, right? It's it's much it's much better for them than talking about why they're substance abusers or something, right? Uh, that's where I saw the power too. And again, not having to necessarily, and I think we're learning this in the trauma world, helping to regulate the, the stress response without having to relive your trauma or disclose your trauma. That, that's why it's like, I, I think that there's so much a power in this. And it, it may be in some instances, the intervention and others, like I kind of hope that kind of HRV biofeedback, uh, you know, what, what we're trying to do with Dr. Hazan and, and her work is like almost the, the greatest homework assignment a therapist could give. Like, obviously there would be some stuff happening in the sessions to set people up, but RF breathing rates and other things, it's, it's kind of like, to me, the equivalent of the journaling we, we always give people as therapists is like, here's, uh, you know, I, I don't think we're going to give up journaling anytime soon, but this has got to be at least I, I think in our thinking around those issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, we, we all have the clinical experience of that, you know, like a, a, Anna was at a sharp pain and then we do it. We have a clinic on campus. So we see a lot of kids with functional gastrointestinal. I mean, and we get almost most of them better. And the people yeah. at Sharp, they, they, at this pain center that we started actually to, to based on, biofeedback kind of things has a long-term history of getting long-term disabled people back to work um, with, you know, chronic pain of all kinds. And so you can sort of see, and, and you can see the patients gravitate towards something concrete like this. They love it. So, but that being said, it's still hard to kind of get the, the big, the big uh, organizations to kind of move around towards that. So I think it's changing a little bit in some areas because we've seen a big influx of psychologists into medical specialties. Mm -hmm. So now there's cardiac psychologists, pain psychologists, gastrointestinal psychologists. I'm working with Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. They've got a staff of about five really top-notch trained, when some of the trained in Vanderbilt, one of the best places for gastrointestinal. They totally get it. They, they interface with the docs beautifully and now they're, and they, they're hungry for about feedback and they're, that's, that's what we're doing. We're putting it into the, those systems. Um, but it's funny that, you know, given what we do at Sharp on uh, that very few other pain programs actually do anything like that. So uh, yeah. I don't know if, if you've got a chance to describe that ever on, on your chat, but it, but it, you know, it's a program that we started. It has to support itself on its own fees and it has done that for 20 years or something and has remarkably good outcomes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not just biofeedback, but biofeedback is a big part of it. So anyway. Totally, totally. I think um, the fact that something that I've come to realize too is I think a lot of bringing biofeedback, whether it's like, you know, sometimes it's hard to get it in the research, like the actual interventions, but I think it's also just spreading the excitement and the, and the stories, because the stories are really powerful for people too. And, um, you know, I remember I had a patient who would say, when I do my diaphragmatic breathing and I'm, you know, watching my heart rate during, you know, my appointments at Sharp, 
you know, I feel like I'm in a safe haven, like, cause the, when they're in pain, they just feel like they're constantly in battle. Mm-hmm. And when I just remember her saying that, I remember her face and she just said, it's my safe haven. <laughs> and, you know, they, that's like the first time she's felt that. And sometimes their whole life, cause it's like part of their identity is to be on the go and do everything and be perfect. And, you know, I think what's, you know, and it's unfortunate because of the, you know, the crisis we're in, in terms of just like mental health since, you know, current post pandemic is a lot of people are just trying to figure out how to manage stress or because they just couldn't do their jobs anymore. Um, I've noticed like more people are asking me and more curious about it because, you know, like they go to talk therapy and they kind of get like, okay, here's what I need to do. I need to calm my nervous system, but how do I do that? Um, and so I think it's a really important piece in terms of, um, just being able to one, like see your data. And I, what I really like about the optimal HRV is I, I've been doing it myself and to be, and I'm going to be full disclosure here. I had a hard time adhering to daily breathing. I totally did. And what I really liked about like the app was like, it'll pop up in the morning. It'll be like, did you do your reading? Did you do your training? And I'm like, no. Um, <laughs> and it's awesome because then it's not like, it's not like a jerk to me. It's like, you have to do it now. It's just like, Hey, have you done it? <laughs> and, um, and it, I get to watch my heart rate. I get to actually see it. Cause I know a lot of times with patients, I feel like before these apps, it was like, okay, self-report, did you do it? And then they say yes. And you're like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> Um, and we had to rely on that. And now with like this kind of technology, we can say, oh yeah, they did it four days this week. And they did at these times, you know, pre-workout, after workout, you know, before they had cravings for alcohol or whatever. So we can really have insight to like what that looks like when they're doing it at home, because a lot of them would just do it once in the appointment and then go all week and not do it again. And it's like, it really is that adherence is challenging. And I can, you know, attest to that challenging part but I think when you start to actually see the changes in your graph and you see the improvements and I mean I think that just depends on some people like see data some people that doesn't really motivate them but for me it's like oh my gosh I'm doing something that's actually working um so you know I with all that being said you know I think you know we've got like newer technology we have you know I think we have a climate in our country in the world that's just like what do we do with our nervous systems now like this was all very traumatic the world just like didn't know what to do how do we like recover from this like it was you know it was traumatic for millions of people um and so I guess like I know like there's the challenges, but like, what do you hope to see for the field of HRV in terms of like the science and then HRV biofeedback? Um, I would say like in general, and then also in terms of like maybe future uh, providers. Yeah. So one thing we're, we're now, we're, the COVID has been a benefit is that because we couldn't, uh, our clinic is on our university campus, Matt. So they closed the whole campus. So we had to see everybody remotely. So we uh, found this one device that was cheap enough to for the clients to buy the, the keto, the keto, um, and it seemed, and we've tested it and it's pre- reasonably good. Um, so it wasn't definitely not as good as getting them into the clinic, but we asked the we mostly are see kids and adolescents. We asked them to uh, hook themselves up during their resonance frequency practice and export the data to us. So what we found out is the kids that were not getting better were not practicing at the right <laughs> breathing frequency. Oh, fascinating. So they were practicing, but just at the wrong. Yeah, well, or they weren't practicing at all. Yeah. <laughs> we, we had a lot of those always, but we sort of knew who those were. Yeah. These are kids, oh, yeah, I practiced four times this week, doctor. And we look at it, and so this kid's resonance frequency was seven breaths a minute. And this is with a pacer or with music, right? But they were just distracted. They're breathing 11 times a minute during their practice. Yeah. And that, that the neatest one was that kid was not getting better. And one of the interns start texting him on a regular basis. Every time she saw a wrong practice, she just bugged him on texting. And he was a teenager. And he started practicing it. Uh, like within three weeks, he started getting fewer symptoms. <laughs> That's awesome. So it was like, oh, wow. You know, there, there might actually be a dose-dependent relationship here. Who knows, right? We, yeah. We've never really known that. We've got a little bit of data on that from a study with the Meru 
Meru is an online therapy. Uh, it's a Finnish outfit, but they're also in the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, some years ago, they added biofeedback to the CBT that they do online. So we have, and, and they do export all that data um, using the hard math hardware. Um, so we tried, we just did publish a study, in fact, trying to see if we could predict depression reductions based on how their practice was going. And we did find one pretty good predictor, which was the slope of the low frequency over time, hmm. right? So remember when you're breathing at resonance frequency, you get a single peak in the low frequency range. The height of that, the height of that peak is dependent on the peak valley differences and the smoothness of the waveform that you're doing. So when we looked at the slope of the lines, that was a predictor of, of depression reduction. So that's the first study I know of that actually looked at like any kind of dose dependent relationship with home practice and outcomes. And we all had a lot of anecdotal data, but this is the first one. So that's for the future. We're gonna do a lot more of that. So right now, um, one of our students is doing a, a study with the LEAF therapeutics. They're cooperating with us so we can actually get really good ECG data. Uh, so they come into our clinic, we fit them with one of these devices, uh, and we, after we train them and we watch them for a few weeks and see, do they really practice at all? If they practice, do they practice the right frequency? How long do they do it for? And then plus we have symptom outcomes. I think we're going to get a lot more of those kinds of studies that are really going to be powerful. Um, right now, I have a first-year student who's working with Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, as I've been uh, the person who's the head of gastroenterology there came from our children's hospital here. Mm. Lovely, lovely gastroenterologist person, Dr. Hayat Musa. And they, they were able to come up, they, got, they were able to get a, a contract with UCSD Biomed to come up with a device that measures gastric motility non-invasively. Mm. So we can actually see whether we're actually affecting the gastric motility, which is really exciting to gastroenterologists. They care about that. Yeah. So we're gonna be able to see pre and post treatment, whether, uh, whether gastric motility is in fact the mediating factor. We know the kids get better. In one study, we had 28 consecutive cases and all of them got better. Uh, 75% uh, were completely symptom free, 25% had just a few symptoms left. So in general, for the uncomplicated cases of these kids with, with gut problems, they get better. And if we can show that it's because they're actually changing the motility of their gut, that will make a big splash in, in the GI world anyway. So I think there's gonna be things like that in cardiology, in pain, in, uh, in gastroenterology, um, I'm uh, our UCSD. Uh, I guess they got some big money coming in. They're going to send it, have a digestive disease center for adults, and the gastroenterologist is totally interested in this for for GERD, for GERD or for esophageal problems. So there are these little pockets in areas where people have kind of reached out and are looking for ways. And I think what will end up happening at programs like yours will be the intervention because it's so much more practical than having, we might get, we might be able to get one session in a lab finding resonance frequency. And after that, the home practice will be on some platform like yours. Uh, and they'll, th those are getting better and better. So, I mean, I, I see that as a big future. Also, just in, just in terms of the lay public, I'm sure you guys want that. Just people are gonna be wanting to get involved in platforms like this. Uh, the, the danger of that is that it could look like a fad. It'll be a big hit. And then people say, well, this is too much trouble to do every day. I won't do it anymore. But um, we have to kind of find ways of really making that work, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, and I would be, I'd love to get, uh, I, I feel like the bumbling idiot in this conversation. Like I just heard about heart rate variability. Uh, like why, why isn't everybody on it was my first question. Why isn't everybody measuring this? And then I heard about HRV biofeedback as part of my studies. And 
the first person I called was Ina and she agreed to join our, our efforts. So, so I just kind of feel like I'm bubbling and stumbling in, in your world uh, and, and feeling incredibly privileged and hope to give do some good with that bumbling. And I would love to just get, as, as you've sort of sat and learned uh, uh, for, from some of the best people, uh, you know, in this field, including our guests, just where, where do you see this? Because you grew up with technology in a different way than, than we did. What, what do you, what, when you look in 10, 15 years from now, I'd love to see where, where you sort of see this, uh, you know, go, going with your, your unique perspective, at least among uh, the three of us. Um, well, I would say I'm very like optimistic. I mean, I, w when I was at the conference and I went to y'all's tent or not tent, but exhibit, <laughs> I don't know, wrong word. But anyways, when I went up to y'all and you showed me the app and you were showing me that you, and there's like the provider platform and then the patient or participant uh, mm -hmm. version so that, you know, it's, it's very nice because then you can kind of get an idea of like how your patients are doing because we, I remember Dr. Goodrich would say this in class, you have a session in talk therapy and then they walk in the parking lot and they're like, oh, now what? Yeah. <laughs> right, the parking lot effect. And I think what's cool and Matt, you brought this up too, is that, you know, when we're looking at the data and we're looking at our patients data like in our portal, we can say, okay, you know, it's been like, you know, past two weeks, they're like saying in the average uh, range we're looking for for their age. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the week, like let's say this current week, everything is below average. Um, they're not practicing that much. Like we can reach out to them and say, hey, just checking in, like as a reminder, what's going on? Um, because a lot of times, you know, I, it allows for them to feel more comfortable saying what's really going on. Sometimes it's scary for them to say, Hey, I'm still, I'm struggling more than usual. Um, I need to figure out something to do here. And I think like having that is really helpful. And then also what I've experienced with the pain program is when patients were like, yeah, I don't know why I'm here for behavioral health. I have chronic pain. I don't know why you're relevant. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then when I would do the biofeedback with them or explain to them heart rate variability, they would listen a little bit more. They'd be like, oh, oh, that has to do with my mental health. And I was like, yeah, I mean, think <laughs> about it. And I was like, think about when your pain is skyrocketing, does it make you more stressed? And then when you're stressed, do you feel more pain, vice versa? Can we interject somewhere in that vicious cycle? And they're like, oh, okay, I'll come in next week and then we'll see how it goes, you know? Awesome. And then they keep coming back mm -hmm. and then it like kind of gives them a different entryway because of their, there is stigma with mental health services. So I think what's great about like biofeedback and just like, you know, different psychophysiological approaches and interventions is we can kind of help people who may kind of, may not have come in otherwise, but they are interested in biofeedback. Like I've had patients at the private practice I worked at who said, I'm coming here for biofeedback, but not therapy. I was like, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Um, and it's, sometimes we don't do more than just the training and that's fine, but really, I mean, it's still addressing their mental health, right? Um, so I think it's gonna help people have like another avenue. I think spreading the works, a lot of people, like it was surprising, like, when I was in Dr. Wirtz's class, I was like, oh my gosh, same thing. I was like, how do people not know about this? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was like, oh, really excited. He probably remembers. Um, <laughs> and it's hard to get excited in some classes, you know? <laughs> so, um, but I think the more we spread the word, like when I talked to other graduate students in their year one, I'm like, you got to check this out. You got to see how we're going to make it more accessible. We got to see how we can make it a part of trauma treatment, a part of pain treatment. And they get excited too. Like it's contagious. You know, you don't always hear that when someone's like, so have you heard of this really, I mean, I don't want to diss, but like really cool talk therapy. Yeah. Um, but when people hear stuff where they can get involved technology, using these outcomes for like, I know you've written books on this too, Matt, like about like looking at well, you know, wellness of your employees. Mm -hmm. Like, I think it's just like, it helps us to really see things on a macro level, on an individual patient level, and also just really, um, help us to kind of get an idea of how people are doing 
with kind of what Matt said in his presentation, kind of like a, an x-ray of kind of how they're doing. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's, they're always like doing poorly. It just like gives us a reason to reach out. And even that itself is huge, right? Um, I know we're getting close to the end here, but I, I, see, I see some things really changing, especially because of the pandemic. I think people are more serious about their mental health and they're willing to invest in it. And even if it's like five bucks a month to do it, like, you know, that's definitely better than paying, you know, hundreds of dollars. So I think people are, and it's kind of sad, like, I think people are almost like desperate and are motivated enough to say, like, I can't put myself through what I did during this pandemic, like this can't happen again. Yeah. So I'm hopeful. Awesome. <laughs> that, that leads me to a question for you guys, and you can edit this out if you want. <laughs> Have you thought about going to like, uh, raise money through advertising or other sources rather than subscription? I think subscription is going to be an obstacle for your platform. Yeah, I mean, we we have. Um, I, I the, the question mark I have would that turn people off versus would it would free? I mean, right now, where if you do it yearly, we're less than five bucks a month, which for some, I mean, my, my whole thing was with the populations that I created, you know, and started this, it had to be affordable like it it couldn't be a hundred dollars a month or you know it had to be a and it had to be accurate which sometimes those are tricky to work both you could do cheap and inaccurate or or vice versa so i i, I would i've been kind of thinking and then you know if 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 one of the mount rushmore of hrv would tell me it's okay like if before a reading or biofeedback, we, we could th throw a YouTube video out there and give it away for free. Um, you know, I, I'm not against that. You know, I, I've had that thought uh, a few uh, times along the way as well, is that people are used to watching at least the intro of the YouTube video. And, uh, you know, could we could we give it away for free if we we did that? And we're yeah, or have we have an option that if they don't want ads, they pay something, you know, yeah. like a lot of people do. I think yeah. that, I think you'll get more. I think you'll get yeah. more. Well, there's, there's so many things out there that are, end up with like a monthly fee that people don't want to do. Yeah. It's the thought I've had about it anyway, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, it's definitely something. It's like, how do we get this to as many people as possible? Uh, and how do we pay the developers and all that? Again, never thought I would say I, I have a tech company. Uh, and uh, we yeah. got a great team, and Anna has been a great uh, addition to that. So, uh, I, Doctor, I, I just want to thank you for your time. I, I don't know if we would be here if it wasn't for you. Uh, you know, uh, being part of the chain that you helped create in many ways. Uh, I, I just want to uh, say thank you for all the work that you've done. I, I know I learned a ton from you just at the conference um, and even like just getting ready for this, watching some, I, I, I got in a rabbit hole and didn't get my to-do list done today because I started watching your videos um, <laughs> online. So um, in the show notes, we'll, we'll put your, your bio in there and contact information. And uh, hey, just a shout out, whoever wants to partner with us to do that research study, uh, I, I think the three of us are, are on board. So so, uh, uh, but I want to, I want to again, just thank you for your work and please, uh, hopefully we can spread the word uh, about work you're doing. And if you've got anything else, uh, you'd love to talk about, uh, the invitation is, uh, always open. So, okay. Okay. Well, keep up the good work. It was great to talk to you. Great to see you again, Anna. You too. Thanks for joining us. Okay.